and six million dollars in the hole, child. He probably better off in prison, at least the food free. We unbigging our backs. I'm sick of opening my front camera and seeing two chins, but listen. <laughs> We're gonna hop into today's video. Hey, I didn't even say hey. Hey y'all, how have you been? Welcome back to the channel. My name is Kennedy. If you're new here, if you're not new, hey girl, how have you been? Girl, I've been gone. I've been resting, really. I don't have an excuse. I don't have a reasoning for being gone. I've been laying on the couch watching the Jamie Foxx show for like the past two weeks and it felt amazing. Um, that's how I know I needed a break because I don't feel guilty. I was relaxing during the day at least we had a lot of extracurriculars and stuff like that going on um with the kids after school basketball beta like a lot of stuff but what's up welcome back to the channel it is a monday Woo. and it was time for me to get back to work chow i'm starving but i'm not gonna subject y'all to me smacking the entire video like a damn rabbit but i'm happy to be back if you caught the live i think we went live saturday night it was a mess. Uh, <laughs> my kids were running around crazy the whole video. The next time we go live, I know y'all don't mind, but child, I couldn't form a complete sentence or a complete thought with the kids running around. The next time we go live, the kids gonna have to be going, okay? But I love the lives and being able to talk to you guys on like a not so true crimey note. You know what I'm saying? Speaking of true crime, our first true crime binge video that we did with new cases i woke up to a copyright strike because of the tv footage like the news footage i had in that video so i deleted that video this morning since that video had to come down i'm going to work hard and try to film another true crime binge video with new cases on thursday and get that up for you guys sunday and hopefully before that we get about two to three videos in okay i'm back Y'all know I like to go hard before my birthday. We got about 13 weeks, 12, 13, 14 weeks before my birthday. So it's go time. We got the struggle scarf on. My hair is actually not bad. It's just oily, greasy. I'm going to wash it maybe Wednesday. Yeah, Wednesday, because I'm gonna film the true crime binge Thursday and we need fresh hair, but I'm gonna film it Wednesday. Because if I don't film it Wednesday, y'all won't get a hair care video because I'm about to put a wig on. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I just want some color and to switch up my hair. And I'm no fool. Um, I'm not bleaching or dying. I mean, dye my hair black, that's one thing. I don't dye my hair black. I haven't since. I don't think I've dyed this hair on my head black before I big chopped the last time I used to dye my hair black. But I don't think I've dyed this specific hair black. I don't think so. I haven't had a reason to. I can't remember child, I don't think I did though. But either way, I'm not bleaching my real hair, but I am about to get back into the wigs, girl. Cause I want some color in my life. There's just no need to bleach your real hair when you can put a wig on. It's never that deep to me. Mm. I knew there was one more thing I wanted to mention before we hopped into today's case. Girl, let me go pull it up, hold on, hold on, hold on. I'm sorry, I swear I'm not gonna smack the whole video. Oh, I just love cucumbers. Mm. No pun intended, don't make that nasty. I did the math, we are 2,397 views away from 100,000 views on the first video to hit 100,000 views on the channel. It's the first true crime binge video we uploaded on the channel. So if you haven't checked that out, make sure you go check it out. 100,000 views on YouTube is like a huge milestone. We have not done that on the channel, so I'm so excited. So make sure you haven't, make sure you check that video out if you haven't already. This is the video right here. I'll also link it in the description for you guys. I love the true crime binge videos. I'm happy that I've kind of like cracked the code when it comes to what works on YouTube on the true crime channel as far as like the algorithm and things like that. But like just compared to my other platforms, I have a video on Instagram that just hit 7 million views, but I got to shake down YouTube for 100K. It's cool. <laughs> Just make sure you check out that video if you haven't already. Um, I'm definitely gonna celebrate that milestone, child. How, I don't know, but we gonna, we gonna do it. Anyways, girl, let's hop into today's case. I haven't said that in a minute. It's been a minute. <laughs> Ow. 
we're gonna hop into this case and then talk about some current true crime at the end of this video so let's get to it girl we're in maplewood minnesota in may of 1981 on the night of may 8th to be exact when 911 calls come in to police from neighbors in a surrounding apartment building they hear some type of domestic disturbance going on they heard glass breaking yelling and possible gunshots so the property is like a rental townhome so you know it's a house but it's like they're all connected you know what i'm saying so the neighbors can hear maybe a window being busted out they hear a lot of scrambling like up and down the skit the stairs and they know that there are three children in the house so they are very concerned all right so police arrive to the home of barbara Wynn. and her boyfriend, Aaron Foster. Barbara also lives there with her three children. They are not his children. They're not Aaron's children, who are young adolescent kids at the time, all right? When they pull up to the home, they see Aaron Foster in the garage and he is obviously bloodied, like his shirt is bloodied. And he greets police saying that his girlfriend Barbara Wynn is upstairs and she is gravely injured, okay? They make their way up to the bedroom. Barbara is on the floor. She has a gunshot wound to the chest and she is surrounded by her three children, okay? So the first thing police do to help render aid is remove the kids from the bedroom, take the kids downstairs and assess Barbara's situation. So right off the bat, police are like, okay, so he shot this woman. He's frantic. He's bloodied. He's got blood on his hands. And remember I told you this case is gonna piss you off, so because his hands are so bloodied, you know, they're taking a closer look at Aaron Foster and they realize he has cuts on his hands and they remember that the 911 calls that there had been glass breaking and they realized that his knuckles, his hands are cut up because he punched through a window in the kitchen. Now we'll get to that later, but I'm mentioning it to you now because police on the scene washed Aaron's hands to remove the blood to bandaged him up while they were talking to him paramedics did not do this it was done by the police on the scene which will be an important part to the case later that his bloodied hands were washed and bandaged before gunshot residue tests could be performed but as they're cleaning aaron foster up and getting an idea of what exactly happened he tells them that Earlier that night, they were at a bar called the Tipsy Tiger with Barbara's brother and his wife. And, you know, they were just having a good time. But at the bar, they got into it about Aaron spending time with other women, like a jealousy thing. This is what Aaron is telling police, that they were arguing over a second woman. He goes on to tell police that as a result of this argument at the bar, he gets up, storms out saying that, you know, I'm going home to pack my shit and leave you like I'm not coming back. And that everything else that had happened that night was a result of her reacting to him leaving. He said he had been back at the apartment for about an hour packing up his belongings. And when she walked in on him packing up his stuff, he was she was upset and so she took the gun and shot herself in the chest in the home with her th three children killed herself right in front of him you see where this is going but it ain't even fucked up yet just keep listening okay after this aaron says okay that he went downstairs to call 911 and this is when he bust the glass out of the kitchen window because he could not get on the phone with the right the police department like he was calling dialing he was getting the wrong police department and for whatever reason in a panic frantically he could not remember the number that the other police department was giving him to call so in his frustration he punched a hole in the window. Hold on, hold on, cause hold on, it gets worse. So he's saying in his frustration of not being able to get a hold of the right police department, he punches out the window. Then he decides to go down the street to the 7-Eleven to call 911. 
not sure what that trade of thought is was whatever okay but he takes the weapon with him he takes the gun that she had used to kill herself with him and throws it out the window inside the road and he tells police he did this because that's what barbara wanted him to do okay yeah just keep hold on why this woman on the brink of death after being shot in the chest or shooting herself in the chest wants you to take this weapon and throw it away when did y'all have time to have this conversation about throwing the gun away why if she committed suicide would the gun need to be thrown away we don't know sure but that's the story he gives police they're able to recover the weapon on side the road aaron foster actually takes them right to it but police are not believing this story that this mother of three children who are old enough to know exactly what was going on and be traumatized by the situation her children were 15 13 and 12 at the time who would have been extremely traumatized by their mother shooting herself in the chest in the next room over like her killing herself makes no sense at all whatsoever why he didn't go next door and call 911 is baffling. How the neighbors were able to call in and get someone right away is baffling. Him telling this story to the police and thinking they're gonna believe it is baffling. The fact that this man never spent a day in jail for this murder is also baffling. Okay, are you ready? Let's get into it. So once Miss Barbara's body is removed from the scene and they can start canvassing their crime scene, the first thing they notice is that the bedroom is in disarray. There's stuff thrown everywhere. There was obviously some type of struggle that took place in this bedroom. And this wasn't like a mess, like you could, you know, equate to him packing up his clothes quickly. It wasn't like clothes thrown about the room. There was a potted indoor plant that had been knocked over, you know. Miss Barbara's curling iron was broken, like in half, like snapped, like maybe it was used as a weapon and it broke. And then obviously the next thing detectives want to do is talk to her children since they were in the house the entire time that all of this was going down. This was at about 12, 15 in the morning on the 8th, okay? So the kids were asleep until they woke up to the sounds of chaos in the home. Now, from what I could tell, the kids, they all were awoken to the sound of the yelling, the arguing or whatever. Aaron Foster going nuts in the home and that wasn't something that was abnormal for him. But they didn't come out of their rooms. They weren't alarmed alarmed until they heard the gunshot. So they all scattered into their mother's room after the gunshot. And they consoled their mother as she took her last breath and as Aaron Foster raged around the house, trying to call 911, punching holes in windows. The children go on to tell detectives that, you know, after they were in the room with their mother, Aaron came in, took the gun off the bed, and then left to go call 911 at the 7-Eleven that their mother died shortly thereafter before police and paramedics and all that arrived before he was even back from the 7-eleven the children do not believe that their mother was suicidal. the children don't believe that their mother was suicidal she was looking to leave the relationship looking to leave aaron foster but she was not looking to leave this earth okay the children also told detectives that aaron foster was never any type of paternal figure or anything to them despite being in a relationship with their mother for about three years prior to this incident they kind of all lived in the same house like roommates they didn't really like him and never really warmed up to him now initially aaron foster is arrested because child this scene is fucked up and it's given that he murdered this lady but unfortunately he does not stay there long and that is going to be the meat and potatoes of this case why the hell this fool never went to jail and what her kids and her family had to do to come to terms with her death. Murder, her murder. So we're gonna start with Miss Barbara's autopsy, okay? There was obvious signs of defensive efforts from Miss Barbara. She had broken fingernails. She also had various bumps and bruises, but the ultimate obvious cause of death was the gunshot wound that went in 
from the top and down out of her back at a downward angle. So she would have had to been pointing the gun up at herself like this. Not like this. Or most of the time if you, or if you have like, normally when you have like a gunshot wound, self-inflicted gunshot wound to the chest, it may go off to the side, to this side, cause you're kind of holding it, you know, with your arm, your hand cocked at an angle. But hers was pointing up from the top down throughout the back. The bullet actually was stuck in her back. But for this medical examiner, they decided that they could not determine whether this was a suicide or homicide. And so her autopsy is left unconclusive, okay? The medical examiner could not determine whether this was a murder or a suicide. Now, one of the several fucked up things about this case is that what is later found out is the medical examiner had a guest during the entirety of Miss Barbara's autopsy. This man's name was Bill Finney. And Bill Finney was a lieutenant at the St. Paul Police Department, which basically St. Paul is just the biggest city right next to Maplewood where this happened. But... And obviously having a police officer there for the entirety of an autopsy is strange. But what's extra strange is that Bill Finney is good friends with Aaron Foster. And identifying a body is one thing which we already know that was already taken care of. But coming in to watch an autopsy done on somebody that you knew is very hard to watch not something you would really want to do so him being there is extremely abnormal especially because he had nothing to do with the case and because he was not working on the case because he had no involvement whatsoever other than being aaron foster's friend it's assumed that he was there to apply some pressure on this medical examiner you know that would be a very intimidating presence to have somebody high up in the police department standing over you while you perform an autopsy and at the very least, people feel as though Bill Finney made it a point to be at the autopsy to know the results, like if it was gonna be classified as a murder or a suicide first, so they could pivot and adjust accordingly. So they wouldn't have to hear it, you know, later on. Aaron Foster would know right away that if this was classified as a murder, he was prime suspect number one and the only suspect in the house. But they also obviously do gunshot residue tests on his hands as well as Miss Barbara and her gunshot residue tests do come back with gunshot residue but we'll talk about that later and obviously Aaron Foster's comes back negative but remember I said his hands were wiped, washed, cleaned and he was bandaged because of what he had done to the kitchen window. And when you think about it, you punch with your dominant hand. So that would have been the hand he used to shoot the revolver. So obviously whatever gunshot residue that was on his hands would have been washed off, wiped off when the police at the scene were attending to his cuts and wounds and picking the glass out of his hand, all of that, you know? So Miss Barbara's case, um, I may call her Bobby here and there. That is a nickname that she had. A lot of the reports, her, her name is Bobby, but her name is Barbara. But Miss Barbara's case is left right there because it's not determined to be a murder. You can't investigate an undetermined possible suicide. You know, there's no, you know, there's nothing else that goes into it. It's left undetermined. Aaron Foster is in prison in jail for like three days and then he's released. He doesn't have the gunshot residue on his hands and that's kind of where it sits for a solid 20 years, you guys. Things don't really pick up again, you guys, until 2002. When the case kind of gets its own little whistleblower, a reporter who comes across the story, looks at the evidence and realizes, you know, the whole Bill Finney involvement. And this man is like, oh, fuck no. Like this, this ain't right. This ain't right. <laughs> There's lies, fallacies, and cover-ups happening, okay? And this reporter, being a reporter he was a reporter in st paul had a lot of connections had a lot of ears to the street and he started talking to um and he started talking to other officers who were on the force 
1981, you know, to see kind of what they heard, how they felt about what happened. And it was a lot of talk and chatter between fellow officers, like, you know, like something ain't right, something's fishy, but you know, you can't really go against the higher ups. Cops kind of go out of their way to protect their own. Nobody wanted to be the one to push the button, but everybody felt like it was fucked up, you know? So this reporter, his name is Tom. The first thing he decides to do is look at the case file. And what he realizes is that it ain't shit in this case file. First of all, he feels like a thorough investigation was not done from the jump. In going through her case file, he decides to reach out to her next of kin. Remember in the case file, her kids were minors at the time. So there's no information, their phone numbers or anything like that. So the person listed as the point of contact in her case file is her brother, okay? The same one that was at the bar with them that night. And you know, basically he reaches out to them and he says, you know, I'm looking into your sister's case. I feel like there was no justice served. I feel like it was not taken seriously the first time around. Let's do what we gotta do to get some movement in this case. You know, like, will you help me? Will you talk to me? Can we make something shake? Cause this ain't right. He gets with the family, he starts meeting with the family, they have regular meetings, but they know this is going to be an uphill battle because now at this point, Bill Finney is the police chief. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <sighs> but the first step they take is just to get this case back into the forefront of people's minds 20 years later, and they take it to the news. He does the reporter time, he does a piece on the family and what happened to Miss Barbara. But Tom said, I ain't get no sleep because of y'all. So y'all ain't gonna get no sleep because of me. And he makes sure to mention in his reports that Bill Finney and Aaron Foster were friends. They grew up together and they kind of had like a protector rapport with each other, like watching each other's back. And while they lived very separate lives and went down very separate paths, Bill Finney was the police chief. Aaron Foster was a violent character who also had ins and outs with ins and outs with like the drug business even though they lived very opposite lives okay went down opposite paths they still remained close like brothers and luckily because of Tom's reporting on the situation what had happened 20 years ago they decide to reopen the case all right in 2002 and the new lead detective on the case, she's a woman. And what she decides to do from a woman's perspective is to talk to his exes to see what kind of man he was in relationships. Was he violent? Was he abusive? Did he have a record, a track record of being aggressive towards women? And no surprise, no shocker there, he was an absolute menace. They learned that Aaron Foster's first wife reported that he pulled a gun on her and a friend of hers as she was trying to move her stuff out of his house and get away from him. And his second wife went through the efforts of trying to get a restraining order through for against against Aaron Foster, but she was never able to do so, okay? But when this woman went to the judge with her restraining order, you know, trying to get it pushed through, Aaron Foster had a plethora, a laundry list of high-ranking officers come in and testify on his behalf as a character witness, including Bill Finney. So this woman was ne never able to get her restraining order because he had all these cops declaring to the judge that he was a great person. Ain't that about a bitch. In the midst of all these restraining orders floating in the wind, police reports floating in the wind, they learn about another police report, another incident that happened the night Barbara was killed. This man pulled a gun on somebody else hours before Miss Barbara was killed. Hours. And this police report was not taken into account. Now this incident happened at the Elks Club. For the life of me, I couldn't really get a grasp of what the Elks Club is. Um, from Google and Wikipedia, it says it's like some type of fraternal meeting situation. It, it, Google ain't do nothing but confuse me further. Maybe somebody in the comments can explain um, what the Elks Club is. From what I could tell, it's like a... Um, like not a fraternal organization in the sense of like, you know, divine nine college based things. It's like, you know, a separate outside organization for older gentlemen kind of think of like 
a Black Panther situation, but not like that. Like the same meeting, the same type of club situation, but not exactly aligned like a Black Panther. You know what I'm saying? I mean, Black, Black Panther in the sense of like an independent organization, okay? That's the closest thing in my mind I was able to compare it to. But he was at the Elks Club, okay? So he pulled a gun on this man in the bathroom. Luckily, he didn't shoot him, but he was telling this man, you know, you've been messing with my girlfriend. I don't appreciate that. Like, you need to chill. But pulled a gun on this man in the bathroom. This is a police report documented. It happened, but for whatever reason, it wasn't brought up. The fact that that man pulled a gun on somebody else, threatening their life because apparently, supposedly, he was pushing up on Miss Barbara, that all this happened hours before he went home and shot her, allegedly. That was never brought up. Nobody knew. It was literally, like I said, all these police reports, re attempted restraining orders floating, literally floating in a damn wind. And then if you want to get even more upset when they go to look at the actual physical evidence from the crime scene, it's gone. It's gone. So they can't retest these materials. Um, and they figure, you know, anybody could have probably went in and took it. Any officer who wanted to could have went in and took it because they didn't store evidence back then the same day, the same way they do now. Like anybody could have walked into where the evidence was being kept, snatched it up out the little bitty box it was in and went out about their business, okay? Which leads me to believe that there was a damning piece of evidence in that evidence, in that original evidence box that was overlooked the first time that somebody went back for. But we'll never know. So without being able to retest their evidence with modern technology, modern advancements, they're kind of just stuck. Um, they reinvestigate the case for about six months before the case is closed again. And then it's not reopened again until 2006 when a new sheriff is appointed. Now this new sheriff had been familiar with the case, um, you know, his whole career. And when he became sheriff, he knew exactly who he wanted to give the case file to. So he handed it over to somebody else. And this person reopens the case and puts more feet to the ground. So this new detective, his name is Bill. And Bill decides he needs to go back like as a detective. Remember the other guy, he was a reporter. He wasn't a detective. So Bill decides to go back as a detective and talk to family again, okay? Because they know that there was some type of mishandling going on. So they feel like whatever the family told detectives in the beginning, you know, it, it, we can't rely on what is in the case file. We don't really know what happened because obviously all this shit has been altered. You know, people fucking up, things are being thrown away, things are going up missing. We need to talk to the family like firsthand. And what they find out from her sister, from Miss Barbara's sister, is that the night that she was killed, she was actually the one who was getting ready to leave Aaron. And she had actually written him a letter. There's actual photo evidence of this letter. And in this letter, she wrote it to Aaron saying that she was ready to leave him. And not only was she ready to leave him, but she was looking forward to her life without him that was written in the letter so they know that this woman was not suicidal okay mr bill the detective the new detective on the case he wants to look at the autopsy photos but when he calls into the coroner's office to get autopsy photos they tell him they don't have any they didn't take any not only did they not have any they tell this man that they did not take autopsy photos Which is an alarm bell because it's the same medical examiner who actually performed her autopsy all those years later. And this medical examiner personally says, I did not take autopsy photos. I did not take autopsy photos. That's what he tells Bill, okay? Which is a clear cut and dry contradiction to the coroner's report, the autopsy report that he filled out. There is a little box on the autopsy report that asks F pictures had been taken and it's not a check yes or no it's a write it in and he wrote in yes to there being autopsy pictures taken so where the fuck is these pictures 
but luckily they don't stop meddling and eventually autopsy photos miraculously materialize even though the medical examiner said he didn't take them even though he put on the autopsy report that he did take them and the first thing they realize from the autopsy pictures once they get them is that miss barbara not only did she have a gunshot residue on her dominant hand, but in the pictures, you can clearly clearly see, all right, gunpowder on her left hand that comes out of a revolver from the front end. So not the end that she would be holding to shoot herself, but the front end of the gun. And that space between like the barrel of the gun and the clip of the revolver. So what they deduced for her to have this gunshot powder visible on her left hand, all right, her non-dominant hand and the gunshot residue on her right hand, she would have had to have both hands on the gun at the same time. So she would have had to have been pointing the gun down, her, down at herself at a downward angle and holding the front of the gun at the same time. Now, who the fuck does that? I don't know. Why would you do this to yourself? I don't know. Is there easier ways to do it? Yeah, absolutely. But what they think is more logical is that he was holding the gun probably to her chest and she was holding the barrel of the gun away from her like this and trying to like push him, you know, further away. Way more feasible, right? Now, what detectives decide to do is move the case and everything going on with the case to a different county because Bill Finney was the police chief and they knew that the district attorney at the time, the person who would be able to indict, you know, Aaron Foster was good friends with Bill Finney as well. So they decide to scoop their stuff up and move to the county over. And the first job is the next county over their medical examiner to see, you know, what they thought happened from the pictures and the autopsy report. And this secondary medical examiner obviously determined that this was a clear cut and dry homicide, okay? There's no way that this woman was holding the gun up at herself like this, holding the barrel of the gun and then shot herself. Chow, it don't make no damn sense. Luckily, they were able to indict Aaron Foster, but unfortunately, this trial just doesn't go anywhere. So on the top of the list of fucked up things that happened with this case, Aaron Foster's history with previous women, with his ex-wife, with his second wife, pulling guns on them is not allowed to be talked about in court. Okay. So they can't talk about his pattern of abuse. So they can't talk about his pattern of a Damn, can I get it out? So they can't talk about his pattern of abuse in the courtroom, okay? And the only witnesses they have are her children. 20 years later, all right? 20 plus years later, not a lot of concrete evidence. He has no gunshot residue. I had a trial, maybe I can see, but they fully acquit Aaron Foster, okay? In the courtroom, totally quit, totally acquitted. And it said that he jumps up shouting and cheering in the courtroom, which if you are innocent, would you really have a jumping, shouting, cheering reaction? Or would you jump, shout, and cheer because you got away with murder? Which one? And for the family, they felt like the trial was kind of just them going through the motions. They felt like nobody was really invested and nobody really cared. For whatever reason, the family is on the record saying like they felt like the trial was just for show, like they knew something from the beginning was off with the trial. Fresh developments in the murder of a Minnesota mother. This week, a grand jury charged Aaron Foster with killing his girlfriend. Investigators say that he shot Barbara Wynn at the home they shared in Maplewood more than 25 years ago. At first, police thought Wynn had actually killed herself. But as Lisa Kiava explains, her family's had their eye on Foster all along. It's a huge step, and uh, we've waited a really long time for this day. A lot of emotions, it's been a lot of years, and then to see him... Tammy Halliburton was 13 years old when her mom died. Halliburton was in the house when the fatal shot was fired, and will likely testify at trial. Remember it like it was yesterday. You know, it's not something you could easily forget. The suspect, Aaron Foster, was released from jail without bail today. His attorney says the passage of time works against Foster. It's difficult to defend yourself against charges 27 years old, let me tell you that. Wynn's loved ones say prosecution was delayed because Foster was protected. His friend is former St. Paul Police Chief Bill Finney. Finney attended Wynn's autopsy in 81 when he was an officer. But he's long denied any interference in the case. 
It was an election issue when Finney recently lost the race for Ramsey County Sheriff. Today, he issued a brief statement saying he believes in the justice system. Some in Wynn's family reiterated their suspicion of the system, angry that Foster now faces a charge of unintentional murder. How you shoot somebody unintentionally and then run and throw the gun doesn't fit together for me in the scheme of things. The prosecutors had asked for $350,000 bail. The judge let Foster go without posting any bail, saying he has demonstrated he won't flee. Foster works at the police impound lot. He's on unpaid leave. Amelia? Okay, Lisa, thank you. And you can watch stories about And then Aaron Foster just doesn't let it go after this. A few years later, he tries to get the acquittal expunged from his record because it was fucking up his life. He couldn't apply for jobs and loans and things of that nature because he had this acquittal on his record. Also, I forgot to mention, he tried to sue them for the unpaid leave he was put on when he went to trial. After he was acquitted, he tried to sue them for wrongful termination and discrimination. Just won't get enough. Um, so what they decide to do is sue Aaron Foster civilly, okay? And y'all know if you're familiar, you're a true crime girl, you know people sue people civ civilly for wrongful death because it's a whole lot easier to prove. Like you don't have to prove without a shadow of a doubt like you have to do in a regular court system, all right? So they decide to sue him civilly. Importantly, it's not a jury thing. You know, it's a judge and this judge obviously not having to present evidence to a full courtroom full of people they're able to present everything they have in front of this judge the letter that she wrote saying that she was leaving him and looking forward to her life his pattern of abuse with his first second wife pulling that gun on that man in that bathroom his history with the police department his friend bill finney all of that her autopsy report, the broken fingernails, the angle of the gun, the gunshot residue on both of her hands, the fact that Aaron and Foster's hands were not just wiped off, but because he was bloodied, his hands were washed and bandaged before he was tested for gunshot residue. All of that is brought into account before this judge. Then Aaron Foster decides not to show up to court. Now, Aaron says that he was never served, all right? We find that hard to believe that he didn't know a civil suit was being brought against him um, because of his friends in law enforcement. That's kind of hard to believe, right? So because he never showed up in 2012, he is found guilty in the civil suit of murdering Barbara Wynn. Obviously, no jail time comes with that, but the judge orders him to pay $2 million to each of her children. So he's in the hole six mil. And six million dollars in the hole, child. He probably better off in prison, at least the food free. <laughs> so, yeah, that's a wrap on this one. You know, sometimes there's no justice. The only thing you can hope is that people rot and burn and fry and twist and knot and choke in hell. And speaking of people rot and burn and twist and just all those bad things, whew, present day true crime is going nuts. The, the lady who put her baby in the oven. Breaking news, a mother accidentally put her one-month-old baby into the oven instead of their crib. Kansas City officials said they were dispatched to the residence around 1.30 p.m. local time on Friday. According to the documents filed Saturday, they responded to a call for a non-breathing infant. Upon arrival, officers said they observed the infant victim had apparent burn wounds. The Kansas City Fire Department responded and declared the one-month-old deceased on the scene. The mother told authorities that she was putting the infant down for a nap and she accidentally placed the child in the oven, mistaking it for the crib. The mother has released a statement, however, the child's name has been redacted. She said, quote, I thought I put blank in the crib and I accidentally put her in the oven. The statement was issued by the child's grandfather. The 26-year-old mother has been charged with a Class A felony, first degree endangering the welfare of a child and death of her baby. Officials said, quote, we appreciate all first responders who worked this scene and the prosecutors who went to the scene in order to issue these charges. At this time, authorities have not provided any further details on the crime. To stay up to date on this case, make sure you click the playlist below. I'll keep you guys updated. What do you think? Drop in the comments. Do not take her to jail. Do not pass go. Do not collect $200. Take that bitch straight to the electric chair. Fry her like she fried that baby. It's time to remove her off the face of the earth. No, no trial, no questions asked. Execute. 
But what is going on in the world? Everybody acting a fool, leaving their babies unattended. A mother, if you can even call her that child, near me, left her two-year-old at home so she can go to the casino with a bunch of other kids. She said she knew that one of the other children had a violent past, came back, and the baby had been beaten to death. To go to the fucking casino? To go to the casino? The casino? Girl. App. This mother and two boys facing charges in the beating death of a three-year-old girl. The East Baton Rouge Sheriff's Office says eight children ranging from 11 months to 12 years old were left alone in a home when emergency responders found a three-year-old unresponsive. That child was rushed to the hospital with bruises and cuts and later died. Detectives say a 10-year-old and a 12-year-old are now charged with simple battery and second-degree murder. Now, the mother who you see here, her name is Terika Scott. She's also the aunt of one of the suspects too. She was also charged with desertion because she admitted, according to investigators, that she recently left the casino. Detectives say Scott also admitted that she knew about the suspect's violent behavior, leading to additional charges of principal to second degree murder. The sheriff's office says another arrest is coming. Let's that is a wrap on today's case. I'm about to put these vegetables down get a coffee so i can edit this video so y'all can see it tonight i'll see y'all some more this week this is the first one y'all tag me in an over 300 pound woman named veronica posey decided to sit on a child and suffocated him this was nine-year-old derica lindsay and according to some reports she was staying with family who were not actually her biological parents but biological family members According to some sources, it was clear that Derricka endured some abuse. She had old scars under new scars, old bruises under new bruises. It was a lot. Now, it was Grace Smith, who was 69 years old at the time, who ended up calling Veronica for reinforcement. Grace told Veronica that Derricka was having trouble at school or listening in the house, and Veronica came to punish her. Now, this is James Smith, and he accounts that, look, I was there, but I really wasn't there. More so that he was an onlooker, and he tried to say that the child was just super out of control, so she deserved to get beat, but not pass away. Anywho, he's married to Grace. Now, back to Veronica. Veronica decided to beat her with a pipe as well as a ruler. It was then reported that Veronica told Derricka to kneel down on the floor and put her lay her head and her torso on a chair it was at that point she sat directly on the child's head and her upper torso Derricka was squirming around saying she couldn't breathe and she repeated that twice now James said that she sat on her for about 10 minutes until she stopped moving that's when they told her to get up. James said, I'll punch you if you don't get up. And Grace tried to help her and turn her over. After a while, they called 911 and they tried to tell them how to resuscitate the child, but it was too late. Poor Derricka was gone in the most horrific way. I can only guess what Derricka was thinking to think that her cousin decided to take her life in that manner. She was sentenced to life, but what do you all think about this particular story? Should certain family members not have custody of your child or what? I'm just, it's a lot going on. The thought of that child dying underneath somebody's stanky, smelly, hot ass, electric chair. And where was this child's mama and daddy? I don't, girl. So a quick Google search says this happened in October 2017, but she was convicted in 2020. This article says her autopsy, Derica, the nine-year-old girl, her autopsy results showed that she had been abused in the days leading up to her death. The medical examiner said she found injury on top of injury on top of injury as she examined the girl's body. Medical examiner Andrea Min Minyard? found brain swelling and noted bruising and abrasions to areas of Derricka's head, neck, torso, and other extremities. And I just, I've never heard of this. Sitting on a child? Sitting on them? Have y'all heard of that? That is literally something that I've never... What the hell?
It goes on to say, police reports detailing the conditions of Derrica's home life starkly contrast the person she was at school every day. She was very bubbly, energetic, um, very nice and polite. It says deputies were called to the home multiple times in the 18 months before Derrica died. It says deputies were called to the home several times because Derrica's younger sister tried to run away from the home and that the girl slept on a stained mattress with no bedding, just a bare, dirty mattress in a home with no air conditioning. How did these kids end up in this person's care? I'm so confused. But how all three of these grown people got together and decided that sitting on this child until she stopped moving was the best form of punishment is beyond me. And if I keep looking into it, I'm going to be pissed off. So let's next, next, next TikTok. This is the hate you give. Next, Benedict was 16 years old, non-binary, living in the Republican hellscape that is Oklahoma. They were viciously beaten in a school bathroom at Osawa High School by a group of girls. They died as a result of that physical assault. After being beaten, she remained at that school and suffered. After the beating, X was unable to walk and the school still did not notify medical professionals. No ambulance was called, no parent was called no bully punished. It wasn't until next went home that their parents took them to the hospital and it was in that hospital on the very next day that they died. This is the hate you give. Next loved nature, their cat Zeus cooking and was a straight A student. Next was a member of the Cherokee Nation. Into death by high school girls in a bathroom in the middle of the school day. A bathroom that Nyx was forced to use because of laws regarding their gender identity. This is the hate that you give. This is a result of that hate, the loss of their life. Now this one has been going crazy in the media because from like initial reports, it seemed as though like she left school beaten bloodied in bad shape and like died as like a clear and obvious direct result of the fight that she was in or the beating that she took. But then body cam footage came out interviewing Nex and she seemed to be like fine and she was talking, she was verbal. And not to say that she didn't die as a result of the beating. We don't know what was going on internally that could have led to her death, but that's what we're waiting to hear. Maybe by the time the video comes out, their cause of death will be revealed. I'm sorry if I said she before. Next is um, binary, but I'm kind of confused because in the body cam footage, Next's mom is talking to the police about Next and is calling Next a she repeatedly. Like, I don't, so I'm trying to. Obviously, waiting for more information on that to come back as well. <sighs> but there was also a walkout at Nexus School in protest of what happened. About 40 students walked out of their classroom. So, child, we, I'll update you when there's an update on that case. But then, moving into this one. So this story is just wild and it would be hilarious except for the fact that this officer emptied his entire clip into a car with a handcuffed black man into his own car because he thought he was being shot at. But what actually happened was that an acorn fell on his windshield. So this dude, he, he arrests this guy, he handcuffs him, puts him in the back of his SUV and then he's, I don't know what he's doing, going back or whatever, and he hears an acorn and he thinks he's hit. He yells shot and is fired, starts shooting into the car, and then his partner starts shooting into the car. Black dude's handcuffed. He leans over trying to play dead. And fortunately, both of these cops, not only are they terrible cops, they're also terrible shots. So nothing hits the dude. Um, needless to say, an investigation was conducted. This guy is convinced that he's hit. He's trying to figure out why he, there's no blood or whatever. He thinks it's because his vest, but they do an investigation to play the video of the actual incident through his, uh, his badge cam or whatever. And it turns out it was an acorn. That's wild. Why is this guy so jumpy that he's shooting into a car? Is this, is this racially motivated? What are your thoughts? Let me know in the comments. 
What pisses me off about this case is that if that black man would have died handcuffed in the back of that car, this would have been another cover up. And we wouldn't have known nothing about no acorn. But since he, but since he survived, we're able to make jokes about it and it's fine. But if they would have blasted that man to smithereens handcuffed in the back seat, baby, this would have been a cover up. They would have planted a gun on his ass and we wouldn't have known the difference. It would have been another protest. And to think that an officer of the law is so jumpy and so scary that he emptied his clip into his vehicle behind a suspect that he handcuffed because he mistook an acorn for a gunshot. Do you sleep with the lights on too? Like, I don't know, this is just not funny to me because if that man would have died, child, an acorn behind an acorn. He would have lost his life behind an acorn. And then he was only arrested because he was driving around in his girlfriend's car. She wanted her car back, so she reported it stolen. Like, not even nothing crazy, okay? He didn't even steal the car. He was, you know, y'all know. Y'all heard of that before. You let your man drive your car. He make you mad, so you call the police. I've definitely heard of that scenario before. You know, he wasn't out terrorizing nobody. He just needed to give that girl his car back. He would have lost his life behind an acorn and driving around in some girl's car while she was at work. And then this one with Teddy Pendergrass, I did not know this about Teddy Pendergrass. Maybe we should do a, our own like Teddy Pendergrass deep dive, but let me know if you had heard about this as well. In the spirit of Valentine's Day, let's talk about the time Teddy Pendergrass paid to get his girlfriend unalived. So in 1974, Pendergrass was debating on leaving the group that he was currently in due to creative and financial differences. AKA, they didn't want to make him the only lead singer, and the money was funny. During this time, he met Taz Lang. She was the ex-wife of Philadelphia Eagles football player Izzy Lang, a big socialite amongst the black elites, and had A-list friends like Dionne Warwick and Nancy Wilson. It's even said that the Jackson 5 brothers would come to her house when they were in town to play with her son. So the two began dating, and then in 1975, he finally decided to leave his group and move in with Taz and her son. The two fell so deeply in love and trust that Teddy wanted her to manage and help finance his career as he was broke. She gave him $15,000, that's about $90,000 in today's money, to help finance his production company, and she drafted up a contract. According to the contract, Taz would manage all the proceeds from his debut album and the merchandising. To Teddy's knowledge, she would also take 10% of the earnings off his debut album and 1% share in his production company, Teddy Bear Productions. It is when Teddy decided to look a little bit closer into the contract that he realized Taz was taking a little bit more than what she led on. Not only was she getting 10% off his debut album, she was getting 10% off of any album he made in the future, on top of 10% on any outside business ventures he ever did. He was furious when he found out about this. I mean, this is the main reason he left the group he was in in the first place, shysty money. But the contract was already signed. Taz was not willing to renegotiate the contract, scrap the contract. In her eyes, it was finalized. And this is where it get kind of confusing as far as where they stood as a relationship, because in some interviews he says that they were together, in others he says they weren't. So I don't know about that, but she did remain his manager. It is on April 14th, 1977, two months before the release of his debut album, that everything went down. Teddy was on his way out of town. He recounts that he kissed Taz before he left and they promised to speak the next day. His stage manager, Jojo Tyne, drove her home and once they got to the house, he got out, opened the trunk to get her things. As Taz was getting her keys out to open the house door, someone popped out of the bushes and shot her one time. The bullet went through her arm, pierced her heart, and she basically died on her porch at the age of 31. Now, Jojo did not see the gunman and he didn't get shot either. At Taz's funeral, Teddy did sing and there were many dirty stares at him. It was just confusing because there was no robbery involved with the shooting. Jojo was untouched. He was conveniently out of town. And remember, she was this big socialite that everybody loved. She had no known enemies. So the sustained conclusion just went back to the well-known dispute about the contract. People believe that he paid the Philadelphia Black Mafia who had members that was close to him. But to this day, this murder has not been solved. It's only a few years later in 1982 that Teddy slammed his Rolls Royce into a tree, resulting in him being paralyzed from the neck down. I don't know, maybe I'm living my best sprinkle sprinkle life, but I feel like 10% of everything you do after I give you a $90,000 investment, that sounds fair to me. Am I tripping? But let me know if you knew this about Teddy Pendergrass. I didn't. 
And do you think we should do our deep dive? Should we look into it? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I wonder how much like public information there is. That's the only thing about stuff like this that happens to black people, especially a long time ago. There's normally not enough information available to the public to like do a whole like sit down video on it. And that can be extremely frustrating. But this is interesting, is it not? And then this last one really threw me for a loop. Are you familiar with the tragic story of Lloyd Avery II? Now you may not know his name, you may not know his story, but I can guarantee you've seen his face before and you know where this picture is from. This is from the masterpiece by John Singleton called Boys in the Hood. And this specific scene is where he kills Ricky. So let's talk about his story because it's really interesting and tragic at the same time. Lloyd grew up in Baldwin Hills, which is known as the Black Beverly Hills. He came from a well-to-do family, two-parent household, a nice house. I'm talking about a swimming pool in the back. He went to Beverly Hills High School, played water polo, baseball, graduated and went to a technical trade school. He eventually dropped out because he wanted to pursue acting. Now, when John Singleton was making Boys in the Hood, he wanted to have an authentic betrayal and he wanted it to be as real as he possibly could. So he was casting people from the surrounding area. Now, Lloyd was from the area, so he ended up getting casted as Knucklehead Number 2, which if you've seen the movie, you know he has a small role, but the role that he had was major for a small role because of what he does and what happens. Now, after Lloyd's role in Boys in the Hood, he became like a local celebrity. I'm talking about VIP club entrance. He signed with a talent agency. He ended up producing music and even produced a song for Tisha Campbell, which was a pretty big deal. Everybody was showing him love. He got a guest appearance on the Dookie Hauser show. I mean, things were going up. John Singleton's second film, which was Poetic Justice, he ended up casting Lloyd Avery again. Now, this was not a big role, right? He was only in the beginning of the movie and he was casted as thug number one, but it was still like another role, right? He still got to be on the big screen and John Singleton even let Lloyd Avery's brother be in this scene with him. As you can see, his little brother right here. After Poetic Justice, Lloyd's talent agency was getting calls for many auditions, but the problem was he was not showing up to the auditions. And when he did show up, he was forgetting his lines. So this same time period, he moved from Baldwin Hills, the nice house, nice neighborhood with his family, and moved to the jungle, which is South LA, predominantly ran by Bloods. And he ended up joining the Black Peastone Bloods and even got it tattooed on him. Now, Baldwin Sykes from Boys in the Hood has been on record saying that he thinks that Lloyd made this transformation in real life because of the praise he got for playing his role in Boys in the Hood. So he thinks that he felt like he needed to be this in real life because Baldwin Sykes has said himself, people have walked up to him and given him praise for using an AK on screen and killing somebody. Now, the next time we end up seeing Lloyd on screen is the 1996 film Don't Be a Menace. He had an uncredited role. It really wasn't much of anything at all. And at this time period, he was a addicted to smoking PCP. He was living from place to place, just moving in with other people and getting into altercations with the people he was moving in with. And he was working at a car wash and selling drugs on the side. Now, eventually Lloyd Avery ends up committing a double homicide. But the crazy thing is after he commits the double homicide, he ends up landing a role in the movie Locked Up, which is one of Masterpiece produced films. And he has problems on set. He was caught smoking PCP. He was caught stealing. He was getting into arguments and fights with the people on set so they eventually had to kick him out it was so bad that they ended up deleting a lot of his scenes from this movie and then a year later even after all these problems and having a double homicide on his head this man got offered his first leading role for the film called shot that came out in 2001 and he threatened to kill the director he demanded to be called by the name g-rod which was his character for this film and he wanted to carry around a prop gun outside of set it was just too many problems. Well, that same year in 2001, he finally ended up getting picked up for the double homicides and ended up getting sentenced to life in prison. But the thing is, he made a complete turnaround committing himself to Jesus Christ, being a devout Christian. And it was to the point that inmates ended up calling him Baby Jesus. That was his nickname. So as Lloyd Avery is known as like this preacher-like figure in prison, he ends up getting a cellmate, Kevin Robbie. Now, Kevin Robbie was a violent inmate. He was often in solitary confinement by himself and he was always 
hurting other inmates. So either he was in solitary confinement or he had a cell to himself. But the crazy thing is they thought it was a good idea to have this preacher like person with this guy, Kevin Robbie, who was actually a known Satanist. So in 2005, as Kevin Robbie and Lloyd Avery are sharing a cell together, Lloyd is trying to preach the gospel to Kevin. Kevin ends up getting frustrated, chokes him and beats him to death, draws a pentagram in the middle of the cell, takes Lloyd Avery's blood and puts satanic rituals on the wall. This was a crazy, bizarre event that threw everybody off in the entire prison cell. If you've heard this story before, let me know. If you haven't, it's wild. Rest in peace, Lloyd Avery, man. Till next time. Am I living under a rock? I didn't know any of that. Now listen, granted, Boys in the Hood did come out like six years before I was born. So maybe, maybe I just, do, do I not know because I wasn't alive? Like that's a lot, that is a lot. The whole video was just a lot. Um, let's lighten the mood. The last two true crime TikToks y'all sent me were just like light, airy, jokey jokes. It's too much going on in the world. You got him in them handcuffs against them walls. He got his sunglasses on. Now you want to come up on me, Paul Blart. <laughs> this is America. Excuse me, do you know how to get into this neighborhood? Oh, no, I'm sorry. I actually live over there. I'm just going for a walk. Ah, uh, dang, I'm trying to find my wife. My phone says she's over here somewhere. Oh, are you picking her up from a friend's house? Uh, no, I think she's cheating on me. Oh, what? My friend, let me in that car. I will help you find this bitch. I thought you said you didn't live over here. I lied. I thought you were a serial killer. Turn right up here. But I'm a woman. Why'd you think I was a serial killer? Just because it's a male dominated field doesn't mean women can't be killers. But you might. Turn left. My tracker says we're getting close. <gasps> Up there, I recognize that house. That's a coworker's house. <gasps> that bitch, throw this rock through the window. No need, she saw me, she's coming out. <sighs> Damn. What the hell are you doing here? What are we doing here? What are you doing here? Who are you? Oh, I'm just going for a walk. Pretend I'm not even here. She's here to help me find you. You're cheating on me with that slut from marketing. I knew it. Are you fucking kidding me? Well, did my wife tell you that she never lets me hang out with my friends, which is why I feel the need to be sneaky like this? <gasps> No, she didn't. Who let you hang out with your friends? Just not the ones that were fucking in love with you. Oh, so Maki, Jenna, Latila, they were all in love with me. Maki was literally your ex. Yeah, from middle school. Just get in the car, please. We can talk about this at home. Well, this was the best walk I've ever been on, but I should probably get going now. Yeah, about that. <sighs> no. We're serial killers. <laughs> I knew it. You did know it. So this whole thing was just a ruse. Yep. You don't think it's too much? What? No, not at all. <laughs> you mean it? Well, it worked on me, didn't it? That's true. <laughs> wow, I should not have gotten in this car. <laughs> you should have. You really should have. Okay, but that was a wrap on today's little true crime TikTok saga. I feel like I just trauma dumped on y'all for the past, I don't know, like 20, 15 minutes. But anyways, let's hop into the true crime. I'm so excited to be back, 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 back. <laughs> but for today's case, we are in West Des Moines, Iowa, February 13th, 1988. Early that morning, 17 year old Jennifer Eaton is getting ready to get up and go to work. She wakes up at about 6.45 that morning. And she notices as she's getting ready that the home that she shares with her father is in disarray. Trash bags on the counter splayed everywhere, plants knocked over. The whole like living room kitchen area was just in disarray. The front door was open and she was very confused because they normally kept like a super tidy home. But she knew the night before that her dad, when he came in, he came into her room while she was like asleep in bed and said, you know, I've got a couple of friends over. Sorry if it's a little noisy, but just go back to bed. And she said, okay. So she knew her dad had friends over and you know, there was a little bit of a kickback party situation but this type of mess was abnormal she says she started to write her father a note like what the hell why the house is so messy because he was asleep in his bed and she didn't want to wake him up but she said as she was writing the note it was just too much it was just too much like the house wasn't too much of a disarray so she decided to go in her father's room and wake him up and be like you know what the fuck happened 17 year old jennifer unfortunately walks into her father's room to a very gruesome scene way worse than what was going on in the kitchen and the living room she found her father deceased in his bed bloodied and beaten 
with a massive stab wound to the chest. And this was obviously very devastating for Jennifer to find her father this way. Like I said, at only 17 years old, but Jennifer described her dad as being like her best friend. Her mother and father had been divorced for a long time, like years and years, and she had a younger sister, but her younger sister chose to stay with her mom and she chose to stay with her dad because she and her dad had always been super close. And Jennifer Eaton's father, our victim in today's case, 41 year old Ken Eaton, was a fantastic father and a well-loved, well-liked middle school drama teacher. He put on big theater productions at Brody Middle School. For years and years, he worked there. And every student who came into contact with him absolutely loved him. So obviously frazzled by the crime scene, instead of calling 911, she calls in to her mother who lives about 30 minutes away. Her mother arrives and they call 911 together. So when homicide detectives arrive on the scene, the first thing that's strange and stands out to them is, you know, obviously how long it took Jennifer to call 911. Remember I said she got up for work at about 6.45. Let's say maybe it took her about 15, 20 minutes to walk around the house to figure out what was going on and then decide to call her mom. Her mom lived about 30 minutes away, so that's an extra 30 minutes. Then they called 911, but ambulances and everything didn't get there until about 10, okay? So that time it took them to actually call 911 was alarming to detectives for sure. There's also no signs of forced entry and obvious signs of a struggle within the home. Ken Eaton, like I said, was found in his bed with a huge stab wound to the chest. He was also naked in bed. No clothes on whatsoever. He had lots of defensive wounds and trauma to his face. And because Mr. Eaton was found naked and there was also like some lubrication found open on the nightstand next to his bed, they assumed that this was some type of sexual situation that had gone awry, okay? But his bedroom is also in disarray. Drawers were open, clothing was pulled out. Like somebody had taken the time to go through his belongings. And obviously, like we said earlier, the kitchen living room was in disarray. They also noticed that the largest knife in the knife block was missing from the kitchen. And they assumed that that's probably their murder weapon because of the large wound to his chest that we talked about. So they live in an apartment complex. So they have close neighbors, possible witnesses, but obviously because they're missing that big old knife, they run to check the dumpsters. So they don't find anything from the crime scene, any of their belongings, anything like that, in any of the dumpsters on the property. But one neighbor said they heard Ken come in at about three o'clock that morning. And the next and only obvious step is to talk to Ken Eaton's daughter, Jennifer, because she was there, she, she discovered the body. And her mom, Lynn, because she was the second person on the scene, and while it just didn't seem physically possible for this 17 year old girl to be in some type of physical altercation like this with her father, with stuff scattered about and torn up all around the house and then killing him, that just didn't seem feasible. It didn't seem possible to detectives, but they still needed to talk to Jennifer thoroughly. Okay, so they bring her in down to the station. First, they strip search her, unfortunately, and, um, but they wanna see if she has any of those defensive wounds, any bumps or bruises anywhere on her body, and she does not, and then they sit her down for an interrogation. And they ask her, you know, the reasonable questions. Why didn't you call 911? Why did you call your mom first? And um, they were very confused as to how this much of a struggle took place in the apartment, and she didn't wake up. But they quickly rule out Jennifer and her mom as suspects. They realize, you know, she's just a scared young girl who just lost her father in the worst way. And she wasn't involved in the crime. But she being the person closest to her father, you know, they decide to ask her questions, you know, 
Would anybody want to hurt him? Yada, yada, yada. Does he have enemies? That kind of thing. So in asking Jennifer about her father's life, you know, what led up to the night of the murder, this is when things and a few secrets, you know, about Ken's life start to unravel. So detectives learned that Ken was an openly gay man, okay? Or as open as you can be in 1988, you know? Friends and family knew, but he hid it obviously at work to protect his job. But she goes on to tell detectives that he had a partner of seven years that even lived in the home with them. Um, she said she and her father's partner and her father lived in the home like a family. It was peaceful, it was beautiful, but they recently had broken up and Ken was getting back out there the night prior to the murder. He had plans to go out to a dinner theater and then hit some of the gay bars in that area later with his friend Bernard. That's what he was doing and then Jennifer was out with her boyfriend. So they were both out mixing and mingling, having a good time, you know, things they regularly did. Nothing was out of the ordinary or unusual. They were both planning on having a good night out and then coming home. And then she says, like I told y'all earlier, her father came in her room at about 3.30 after she got home. She said he said he had company and she said she didn't remember hearing voices, but she wasn't sure how many people exactly were at her house. And then she woke up the next day to chaos all right but that's all jennifer knows and they believe her and then the last final step in their interrogation and getting to know jennifer is getting a list of things that were missing from the home because there was that obvious burglary robbery situation so she makes a very thorough detailed list of the things that are missing from the home watches jewelry vhs tapes clothing cologne like a lot of ken's things were missing most importantly, what you need to hang on to for later is that he had a collection of Hard Rock Cafe t-shirts that he would collect as souvenirs from the different Hard Rock resorts or whatever he would go to. He had a collection of these shirts. The shirts were missing. Then they ask Jennifer about her dad's breakup with his partner, Ed, and they found out from Jennifer that they had broken up and Ed had moved out about two weeks prior to the murder because they just started butting heads really bad yelling sometimes a little bit of a physical altercation and so ed decided to remove himself from the situation so obviously after getting this information from jennifer they know they need to talk to bernard the person his friend that he was with the night of the murder who had who who he'd been out on the town with and then obviously they want to talk to ed his ex-partner because things had obviously at least as far as Jennifer is concerned, ended on bad terms, you know? So the first person they pick up is Ed. And Ed says the breakup was difficult because there was no rhyme or reason um, that he could really give. He said he just fell out of love with Ken. You know, there was no other, there, you know, there was no other person. There was no distance. There was no struggle. He just didn't have the same feelings for Ken that he used to and that was very hard for Ken to accept which is definitely gotta hurt like somebody you spent six years with deciding they just don't want to be with you anymore it definitely is a tough pill to swallow you know that's low-key high-key one of my biggest fears but Ed doesn't have much of an alibi and he says he did see Ken Eaton the night of the murder. He said they were happenstance at the same bar that they chatted, you know, just like catching up small talk real quick because they hadn't seen each other in about two weeks. But he said, you know, that was it. There was no um, argument. There was no escalation, no loud voices, no tension. It was a little awkward, obviously, but no like bad blood. He said he was driving that night for his friends. So they got into his car after the bar closed at around 2 a.m. He dropped both of his friends off at separate locations and then he went home by himself. But when it comes to Bernard and them talking to Bernard, Bernard has a solid alibi. So he gets in the car with Ken, Ken drops him off and Bernard doesn't live alone. So people in the home, they see Bernard, they know Bernard is home, so they know that Bernard was not involved in the murder, okay? He was at his house with his people. 
Now, this is where things get a little bit <clears throat> dicey for detectives. So Bernard goes on to tell them that that night after he was dropped off by Ken, Ken said that he was not done for the night. He was gonna go back out on the town. Now, there's a place downtown, like an outdoor area, like drive-by kind of situation called the Gay Loop, where gay men would secretly go in the area late at night looking for after party shenanigans you know and this is where ken was headed on at the night of the murder according to bernard and they do go out to this area talk to some of the people who frequent and people do remember seeing ken that night or at least his vehicle because he has a very distinct license plate his license plate says i party so lots of people in this gay loop area remember seeing ken in his vehicle that night okay and Ken is also seen talking and leaving with two men in a black Camaro, okay? So he is parked in his vehicle with the lens plate, I party. So people, obviously that sticks out like a sore thumb. And then, <clears throat> then people at the scene that night said that they saw a black Camaro pull up behind Ken. The passenger got out of the black Camaro, got in the car with Ken, they talked for a while, okay? Then the passenger got back out of Ken's car, back into the black Camaro, and then Ken left in his car and the black Camaro left close behind him. They get descriptions of these two people that were in the car behind Ken. They wonder if this was someone who was targeting the gay loop area, looking for somebody to pick up to murder them, like hate crime type deal but they can't be sure um, because they get witness reports that this person was leaning over Ken, Ken's car, talking to him, and then got in the car. They decided to process his car, lift fingerprints, and they are able to lift fingerprints, but obviously they need suspects to test these fingerprints against. But this is really all detectives have so far, you know, until they're able to find a suspect. But luckily for detectives, literally in the craziest twist of fate, evidence just falls into their laps, okay? So about 15 minutes away from Ken and Jennifer's apartment that they shared, there is a dumpster, okay? And the trash men go to pick up the trash at this dumpster. But randomly on trash day this morning, there's a big truck parked in front of the dumpster so they cannot like you know hook the machine up lift the dumpster into the bed you know where all the trash goes so the trash men have to physically get out of the car and empty all of the trash out of the dumpster bag by bag and as these random trash men on this random day at this random dumpster about 15 minutes away from the apartment are removing the trash from the dumpster into the big trash truck what do you call a trash truck garbage truck one of the bags rips open and there's a bunch of bloody items inside of this bag and obviously they call 911 detectives police at the scene know that this murder happened right around the corner and they wonder if it's related most importantly they find a huge bloody butcher knife wrapped up in a shirt and they're able to match this butcher knife at least visually like it looks the same as the knife set at ken eaton's apartment that had one gigantic knife missing okay so detectives have randomly randomly through divine intervention stumbled across their murder weapon how insane is that how insane is that randomly because this random truck was parked on the wrong day in front of this dumpster. And if I was a garbage man child, we would have came back for the dumpster, the next trash pickup. I feel like they don't get paid enough to take bag after bag after bag out of a dumpster. But they did it and literally cracked this case wide open. Isn't that not, like that is crazy to think about. So they test the bloody items found at the scene and the blood is Ken Eaton's blood. So they find all of those items on the 15th, just two days after the murder. And then by the 16th, it's all hands on deck. They figure in this like 15 minute radius, they will be able to find this black Camaro. So they got boots on the ground, just driving around, trying to see if they can find a black Camaro. And they don't have to search very far away, just a block over, they find a black Camaro parked outside of a storage facility. And so they run the plates on their black Camaro. 
And y'all, okay, this black Camaro is owned by a man named James Green, okay? And James Green, luckily for detectives, has a record for burglary. He had done some time for a burglary, and that burglary was very similar to what had happened to Ken Eaton, okay? And quite literally, the detectives on this case must have been jumping up and down. I know I would have been if randomly you find a garbage bag that rips open because the trash men randomly have to take all the trash out of the dumpster by hand. Then you looking for the black Camaro. It's a block away from where you found the trash bag full of evidence. And then the person that the car is registered to already has a record. So you already have their fingerprints and everything to test against the ones found in the car i mean could it fall together any better for detectives what are the odds of that seriously so the big similarity between this crime and what happened to ken was remember i told you guys that the trash bags were like kind of thrown about the same thing happened in that first burglary like, like their perpetrator took the box of trash cans out trash cans trash bags out and pulled a bunch of them off and then started filling them up same thing that happened at ken eden's house that's why there was trash bags thrown all over the place. That was this burglar's MO. James Green, he would rip out a bunch of trash bags, fill them, fill them, fill them, and then get the fuck. Then, if it couldn't get any more easy for detectives, James Green had an accomplice in the burglary he had already done time for. This man's name was Titus, okay? So if they did it together the first time, they probably did it together this time. So now they've got their two suspects. So what they decide to do, instead of going in for Titus and James right off the bat, they decide to watch them, tell them, surveil them to see if they would lead them to any more evidence for a couple of days before swooping in. And this pays off because remember I told you to keep an eye out. We was going to circle back around to the Hard Rock Hotel t-shirt. They catch James in a Hard Rock Hotel t-shirt. So they got him in the t-shirt and then the fingerprint analysis comes back and James Green, his fingerprints are matched to the lube. Remember I said that was by the bedside? And then Titus, his fingerprints were the fingerprints lifted from the car. So obviously getting the fingerprints back is enough for detectives to go scoop up the both of their suspects and bring them in, all right? Game over. James Green snapped, crackled, and popped under the pressure. It was too much for him, honey. He said, I gotta come clean. He said it was weighing on him real heavy. So he tells detectives everything, everything. And James said that he and Titus went down to the gay loop looking for a soft target. Not only did they assume that the, a gay man would be a weaker adversary, but they assumed that because, you know, a lot of people in 88 weren't actively and openly gay that even after everything happened if their victim survived they wouldn't you know go to the police they would be too embarrassed or too ashamed to tell detectives what happened so the crime would go unreported james said when they got to the apartment ken eaton was went to the back of the apartment he came back only in his underwear you know and they were gonna do something they went back to the bedroom James Green excused himself from the bedroom while Titus was in the bedroom with Ken, okay? And James Green was the one like ransacking through the house while Titus and Ken were in the room, obviously quietly asked to not alarm Ken, okay? But then he says that after realizing Ken didn't have much money in his wallet, he grabbed a knife from the butcher block in the kitchen and went to the bedroom and this is when you know they turned the tables on ken where's your money you know because he said he only had a couple of dollars in his wallet <clears throat> ken said he didn't have any money and ken started putting up you know one hell of a fight and he said and james green said he originally didn't plan on stabbing ken but ken was like getting the better of them so he stabbed him and then went through the rest of the house to see what else they could steal. And he says, you know, as they opened the second bedroom, they saw his daughter, they saw Jen sleep in her bed and they decided to quietly exit. So this is why, you know, she probably never woke up because when he ran south the house the first time, he was doing it quietly, asked to not alarm Ken. And then they went in, had the struggle with Ken and then went into the secondary bedroom, saw Jennifer, and then grabbed a couple more things out of the home quietly and then left. 
and once questioned by detectives Titus also tells the same story and James Green was the one who murdered Ken and so the two of them were tried separately because you know laws were just different in 1988 and because Titus said, you know, he did not go there with the intention to murder. You know, that was never, you know, he was never on that type of time. They try him separately, but he's still a dick. And on the stand, he tells a courtroom full of people that all gay people should be dead. Yeah. And maybe if he would have been a little bit nicer, he wouldn't have gotten life in prison no parole, but he did, okay? Even though he wasn't the one wielding the knife, he got life. And then James Green is tried two months later. He also gets life, no parole. But that is a wrap on today's case. Thing one and thing two will never see the light of day. Good riddance, child. I will see you guys tomorrow or the next day. Probably the, ne the next day, not tomorrow, the next day. Maybe one of them days. <laughs> Thank you guys so much for watching. Make sure you subscribe before you leave and I'll see y'all next time. Bye guys. This next story is hard to believe. Police say this man was caught trying to sneak half a kilo of cocaine into a Spanish airport <laughs> under his toupee. After they noticed him acting nervous, officers found $34,000 worth of drugs attached to his head. Al Jackson, Jeff Schroeder, what are you Look thinking? Look at that picture. That's the picture. It looks like a bicycle helmet. <laughs> oh yeah. my God. Yeah, I it's mean. It's not even realistic. Yeah, it's well, actually, I was in the weave game for quite some time. You'd be surprised what type of helmets can be on people's heads. Yeah. Really? Yes. I, yeah, yeah, but that one wasn't even like spread out. That he distributed would be a little bit. He you just put the surprised. whole thing on there. He's like, know. no one's going to see this. <laughs> <laughs> why don't you, if you're going to do that, why don't you wear one like one of the AIM Lincoln stovepipe hats or something? If you're going to look that crazy, I, you know, what happened to just good old fashioned taping it to yourself? <laughs> oh, I, you get patted down nowadays, though. Well, there's so always thought, another option. <laughs> he's the reason why my hair gets checked by TSA. Uh -huh. That's, that's exact. It's his fault. Wow. Yeah. Anytime I see somebody with the, like any kind of hair, especially dreadlocks, they always get pulled out of the line to get their hair checked. So I don't know. I mean, that guy. I don't think they. I think they just took his took it right off. They didn't even check him. <laughs> oh man. I can't knock nobody's hustle. Okay, but what I will say, if you can fit $38,000 worth of cocaine under a wig, I'm in the wrong profession. But well, we're gonna hop right in today. Make sure you subscribe before you leave if you like to crime, if this is your first time here, and we can hop right in. For today's case, we're in Tullahoma, Tennessee, which is about an hour and a half outside of Nashville to give you a little bit of context. And it is a very small rural town, country, back roads. And it is July 2nd, 2012, when a 911 call comes in to some teenagers who are driving up and down some of these back roads when they pass a small fire on side the road. Ooh, girl, could that have been country? <laughs> oh, God. I'm getting too comfortable on camera. I sound like Elmer Fudd. Anyway, let's pass that up. It's July 2nd, 2012. <laughs> Now, I don't know about y'all, but I'm very, like, used to seeing small fires on side of the road in country or parts of Louisiana, people burning trash, that kind of thing. Um, so these kids, they weren't super alarmed. They got out of the car and they were going to go put the fire out that was on side of the road so it wouldn't spread. But when they approached the fire, they realized that it was a body burning. Yeah. But luckily, these kids did make somewhat of an effort to put the fire out before they realized it was a body, stopping it from burning up too badly. When detectives, police are on the scene, you know, they realize that this is the body of a young woman. And there were tire tracks back where she was dumped. So it looked like somebody had, you know, drove out there, dumped her, set her on fire, and then peeled right on off. Now, like I said, the body did not burn because these kids, they saw it, they started putting the fire out, but also, okay, this young woman, she was easily identifiable because it seemed as though the fire was like centered and started in like her pelvic region, which led police to believe, you know, this was probably done in an attempt to cover up some sort of sexual assault. So most of the burning had been done to that part of her body, but they could see identifying markers on like her upper half. So she had star tattoos behind her ears. 
she also had a magnolia flower tattoo which is actually my favorite flower but anyways they could also identify the shirt she had on she had on like a nursing school t-shirt but also leading detectives to believe that she had been sa it was the fact that she wasn't clothed from the waist down so her clothing had been removed from the waist down and also this is where the center of their fire was very weird very strange detectives are like what the fuck but they need to start at identifying their victim but she doesn't have any of her personal belongings no purse no car keys no wallet none of the things so what detectives decide to do because this is a small town is that they post about the body being found with you know the tattoos those identifying markers Facebook is the easiest way to get word around, especially in a small town. And the next morning, Kelly Sharpton, our victim's mother, sees the post, reads about the tattoos, and knowing that she hasn't heard from her daughter, calls into the police department. And her mother, Kelly, does identify the victim as Megan Sharpton, who was only 24 at the time of her passing, and she had just finished nursing school, which explained the t-shirt she was wearing that night. And so now, obviously, knowing who their victim is, they can start up with their investigation. So July 2nd was a Monday. Okay, girl. And they had last planned on seeing each other on that Sunday for like a Sunday dinner at her mom's house. But Megan did not show up for this Sunday dinner. She said she wasn't gonna make it like for their normal time because she had just gotten a last minute job interview that she really needed to make it to. But um, she would stop by later on that evening, but she never came around. They just figured she got tied up with a job interview, but you know, they didn't think that the worst had happened. You know, they weren't alarmed. They figured they'd catch up with her later on in the week and hear how her job interview had went. So obviously they ask her family. She has sisters, obviously her mom, they talk to them, you know, what was going on in Megan's life? Does she have a boyfriend? Would anybody want to harm her? And right off the bat, they kind of ring alarm bells to her boyfriend. Um, apparently they had like a very tumultuous relationship, like young love, lots of arguing, but they figured if anybody had done something to her, it was her boyfriend who she also was living with at the time, okay? Her boyfriend is 25 year old Chris Farrell and he as the person who she was living with even if he wasn't involved should have like first-hand knowledge of what exactly was going on with her leading up to her death right so obviously they bring Chris in to talk to him next Chris and Megan had been together for about four years on and off give or take okay and her family said it was more off right now than it was on okay but Chris was torn up when detectives talked to him and he said that he was at work all day the day of the murder. Not only was he at work, but he had the type of job where he was going to be like on camera his entire shift. Okay. So they could verify, verify, so they could verify his alibi. <clears throat> But he had a similar story to Megan's mom. He said that when he was leaving for work that Megan said she would be gone when he got back. <clears throat> that she was going out to a job interview and that she would be back the next morning. Why the job interview was going to be overnight type of situation, we don't know. But that's what he said Megan told him. But instead of her coming back home the next morning, obviously they got, they got word of her passing. But Chris insists he had nothing to do with whatever happened to Megan. He loved her. That was his woman. And he was going to stick beside her. And he was willing to cooperate with detectives however he needed to. Down at the station, Chris goes on to tell police, you know, that they were just veering off in different paths in life. And that's why, you know, their relationship was kind of not in the best place that you know she just graduated she was gonna be a nurse she was gonna be making a big bucks got her grown-up job okay fucking with a bad bitch and his life was just not going in that trajectory he was not making as much money okay he couldn't be the man to match the woman megan was growing up to be so she was ready to go but through Chris, they learned that there was somebody named Robbie Rosar, a roommate of theirs who was a friend of Chris, who was living in the house at the time, who may know better about what exactly happened that day because he was at the home, he wasn't at work. Now, Robbie Rosar, 
moving in wasn't the best vibe from the outside looking in like this is y'all's little fluff nest why would you have somebody move in but Megan was super sweet welcoming to anybody and she understood that Robbie needed a little bit of help so she let him move in there was no tension or bad blood with the extra roommate being in the house and apparently according to Robbie he and Megan got a whole lot closer than roommates introducing a whole new plot line to detectives okay he said he didn't do anything to Megan and he loved her just as much as Chris did because the two of them had been carrying on behind Chris's back. And why is that the plot to so many true crime stories? Okay, you move in somebody, you think you're helping them and they start fucking your spouse. The, it's always, it happens. It happens. Cousin Faith. So Robbie and Chris pretty much shared the same sentiments. I loved her. She was my girl. We wanted to build a future. I would never, you know, do anything to hurt her. Detectives are like, girl, what the fuck? And then they decide to give them both polygraph tests and they both pass the polygraph test. Stranger things. And this whole ordeal is how Chris found out that Robbie and Megan had been sneaking around behind his back. He had no idea. And he was just in the interrogation room. I mean, falling apart, losing his girlfriend, then finding out she was having an affair with the roommate. Ugh. Talk about twisting the knife. I mean, golly, give him a break. And this is all carrying on and happening the same day, okay, that the body is found, all right? It happened, they found the body early that morning, late that night, early that morning. And then later that same day, they find Megan's car. So her car is found parked on South the road in like a rural area, pretty much like untouched. Just how she left it, no signs of her struggle or anything like that in or around the car. It's found about 30 minutes outside of where she lived in Tennessee. But it also doesn't have any of her personal belongings in it, like the stuff they've been looking for, her cell phone, her purse, driver's license, all of those things are not present in the car. So they still need to find those things. But the one thing that stuck out to them about her car is that she kind of had directions tucked inside the, um, like between the center console and the seat. And they figured it was directions to whatever job interview, you know, that she was headed to because Chris and her mom had the same story about her headed to this job interview. Okay, so she had these directions written down. And when detectives take a look at these directions, they realized that they led her like to nowhere. They led her to this random spot on South Road. She probably pulled over to like get her bearings, but these random directions had no destination. <laughs> So quickly popping in, I am missing the footage of me talking about the autopsy report. So the autopsy basically showed that she had died as a result of blunt force trauma to her head. She had also been shot once, okay? And there was smoke in her lungs leading detectives to believe that obviously she was alive when she was set on fire, but I mean, barely. Um, but they think she probably passed away shortly before her body was discovered by the teenagers driving up and down the side of the road. And she likely passed just shortly before she was discovered burning on the side of the road. But most importantly, she was SA'd and there was DNA recovered. I think people underestimate how actually hard it is to burn a body like how badly her body would have had to burn for the internal DNA to be removed. Like, that's crazy. But this brings us to the 4th of July. People out fishing, celebrating the holiday, come across some of Megan's belongings. It's her purse with everything in it except for her cell phone. So because they can't find her cell phone, they go ahead and order, they subpoena the phone records. Obviously they were hoping to find the phone because it's a whole lot easier to just go through a cell phone than it is to wait for cell phone records to come back. But unfortunately that's what they have to do. In the meantime, in between time, her family sets up a reward and a tip hotline for info on Meg's case, of course. 
and low key people in the community were thinking that there might be a serial killer out on the loose attacking nursing students because a year prior april 13th 2011 another woman had disappeared her name was holly bobo okay and holly bobo like i said she was a nursing student at the time and she had seemingly as well from witness accounts been abducted okay now eventually the holly bobo case and like a serial killer is ruled out because Megan's case is solved before Holly Bobo's case. Holly Bobo's body isn't found until 2014 and her case in and of itself is insane. Six people, six men specifically, were rounded up and charged for her death and disappearance all of the things it's really nuts and then recently it's been in the media again like as of like a couple of weeks ago because the whole case centered around one man's confession and he doubled back after all six convictions saying basically he was lying so they're trying to retry the holly bubble case so technically depending on how you look at it that case isn't even solved and I do want to take a look into the Holly Bobo case, but it's a lot of names, a lot of suspects, a lot of moving parts. Like, it's a lot. It's very involved. There are a few YouTube videos on the Holly Bobo case if you want to check it out. I haven't watched any of them. Y'all know I don't like to watch other True Crime Channel's videos on cases I'm covering until, like, afterwards, you know? But I am interested in taking a look into that. And Holly Bobo also was in Tennessee, if... I did not make that clear. I don't want you to feel like they're just random. They were both like in close proximity to each other. Now, as they're waiting for cell phone records to come back, Chris comes forward with some new information because he says that he had almost forgot, okay? While they were looking into the cell phone records and stuff, that the original text communication and stuff like that, that she had gotten about this job had came into her old phone number and to an old phone you know she had gotten a new phone so that's what was with her the night of her murder but the original like text communications that she had first gotten about this job was on the old phone that was sitting around the house so chris scooped up the phone and took it to police all right and detectives are able to find the number that originally contacted her old phone about this job and when they look into the number it's from like a minute phone, burner phone, okay, does not link back to any one person specifically. And this is obviously very alarming to detectives because it kind of confirms their suspicions of this being like a setup from the jump. Somebody bought a burner phone and then lured her out to this fake job interview and did God knows what, you know? This also tells detectives that he remembered Megan mentioning that this job opportunity came by way through a friend of hers who was in nursing school with her named Naomi. Now, Naomi Jones was like a loose acquaintance of Megan's. They carpooled to clinicals a couple of times together. So detectives obviously decide to go talk to Naomi Jones. Now, when they pull up to Naomi Jones' house, nobody's home, but they decide, you know, this is too urgent of a matter for us to just pick up and leave. And they park it outside of Naomi Jones' house in her driveway. Luckily, a nosy neighbor comes along like, hey, how y'all doing? <laughs> and like, you know, it's like, what's going on? Detectives tell them, that hey we're looking for naomi jones in relation to a homicide do you know her does she live here do you know when she'll be back and the neighbor was like you know actually i have her cell number let me call her up for you and we can get her here you know immediately so naomi arrives and she says you know yeah she knew megan and yeah they were in nursing school together she said they were carpooled together like out of necessity from time to time but they weren't super close and she wasn't like a super close acquaintance and she said she didn't even like Megan enough to offer her any type of job so she didn't know what the hell they were talking about so this ends up being a dead end for detectives remember I said this was a small town small county they're able to pinpoint the store that this specific burner phone was purchased at and take a look at who had been purchasing these little mini phones recently they come across about 12 different transactions and what they decide to do is pull the video footage of each transaction to see if it was anybody they recognized okay 
And one person that stuck out to them, his name is Timothy, okay? And Timothy sticks out to detectives in the footage of him buying this burner phone because he has his cell phone, cell phone in his hand. So why are you buying a burner phone with the cell phone in your hand? You obviously don't need it. What exactly is going on? But Timothy also sticks out to them because they recognize him because Timothy is a criminal informant. When it comes to Timothy, they obviously bring him in. I said I wasn't going to do my makeup, but then I got the itch. <laughs> they bring him in to talk to him. They're not sure if he's involved. He is a criminal informant, but for like drugs and stuff like that, he never had been involved in anything this serious, okay? So they bring him in and tell him, hey, we got you on camera buying this burner phone that's linked to a sexual assault and murder. We're gonna charge you for this. You need to start talking, tell us what's going on. And Timothy says, okay, yeah, this ain't me. I bought this phone for somebody named Donnie Jones, who just so happened to be Naomi Jones's husband. Mm -hmm. And then when they further look into Donnie Jones, they realize that he had also had a couple of rape charges already under his belt so detectives are like wow right under our noses the whole time you know but timothy goes on to say you know i'm i'm not lying this is the truth i promise you he said check the surveillance footage from the parking lot he said he bought the burner phone in donnie jones's truck he said it's a bright red pickup truck you won't miss it all right and then he said, not only, not only, not only did he buy the burner phone in Donnie Jones's pickup truck, but a few days after the murder, Donnie Jones, Donnie Jones totally stripped the inside of the vehicle. New seats, new upholstery, I mean, brand new, gave the interior of his car a home renovation, baby. Brand new everything. Then... Timothy goes on to say, not only did he re 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 damn, reupholster the whole car. Did I still say it wrong? Either way, new interior in the car. Then, on top of the new interior, he sold it. But luckily, because he sold the vehicle and because it was like a legal sale, there was record of the purchase. They were able to locate it and take it in to analyze it without alarming Donnie and then at the same time, they go catch up to Donnie. When they talk to Donnie about Megan, he says he don't know her. I'm sorry to this woman, I hate to sound ridiculous, but I don't know her. Outside of Naomi, you know, carpooling with her and things of that nature. So he's denying, denying, denying. He also denies everything that Timothy had told them. He said, mm-mm, wasn't me boss. And he also, consents to having his DNA taken, which they can test against the DNA found inside the body. And luckily, he don't have to confess because the DNA found on Megan is his. It's a match, it's a hit. So they bring him down to the station to ask him some further questioning, and they ask him about his relationship with Megan again, not yet telling him, you know, that they have the DNA match. So they ask if they had ever been intimate, if, you know, he was in a relationship with Megan, all of the things, if he had seen her that night, all of the things to catch him in a lie. So they catch him in a lie. And then when they ask him about his DNA being found on her body, he says that the sex they had that night was consensual. After that, he left her alive. He don't know what happened in the meantime, in the swing time. Okay. Detectives know that's not true, but they have to do what they can do to prove that. So what they have to do again is wait for phone record analysis to come back to see where Donnie Jones, his phone was at the time of the murder. But in the meantime, in between time, he does not walk away scot-free. He is a felon and they catch him in his car with guns. He cannot have guns as a felon. So he is locked up until they get the cell phone records back. And cell phone records do show Donnie Jones coming from one way, Megan coming from the other way, and then the cell phones meet up where her car was found. And then towards Donnie's family farm. Okay, so he 
led her to this secluded area and then drove her out to the family farm and this is where they think that he assaulted her and her luckily for the detectives donnie's family is not with the bullshit okay they give them permission to search the family farm they don't have to wait for a warrant or anything like that they say come on come if, if something bad happened come on look and they do find additional evidence at donnie's family's farm tucked away into a barrel they found a purple scar that was gifted to megan by her sister that was tattered and torn presumably she had it on that night and all this happens in november so he's in jail from july to november before they have enough to charge him for the murder He does not talk, he does not explain, he does not stop, he does not pass go. He asks for an attorney and he zips his lips. But what they do find out in looking into Donnie is that this was basically a scheme he set up for the BS and that he had actually tried to do this to a woman prior to Megan. Another nurse propositioned her about sitting, like, you know, home health, like sitting type work with the elderly. All right, he tried to get her to come out to this area for a job interview and it was the day of the interview but this woman said that she was bringing someone with her like she was bringing her mother with her on the interview and Donnie canceled it okay so this woman luckily never had to run into Donnie Jones and his shenanigans but this was probably something he would have kept doing if he didn't get caught and they don't think that his wife Naomi was involved, but they do think that he was using her in a sense to find, you know, women in the same field. Luckily, that doesn't have to be a trial because Donnie pleads guilty and is sentenced to life, no parole. And luckily, Megan Sharpton, her case, she did receive justice, but her passing was a lot, very heavy on the family. And in November 2013, her mom passed away from suicide, which makes a shitty case even shittier. I think looking and preying on people who are looking for work, looking for a job, looking to move their lives forward is extremely diabolical. Like searching for a job, I feel like is a very vulnerable state to be in, you know? You need that job, you need your money, and somebody taking advantage of that is sick. And the true crime TikTok for today literally makes me itch. It makes me feel claustrophobic. I just can't. Ugh. A new interview has only left more questions about what happened to Harley Dilly. On the Friday before winter break, Harley vanished on his walk to school in Port Clinton, Ohio. Four weeks later, his body was found just 400 feet from his home. Seemingly that entire time that everyone was searching for him, he was in the chimney of the house right across the street. And we now know that on December 20th, Harley's school did call his mom to say he never showed, but her voicemail was full and she didn't call back. She and her husband reportedly just assumed he was at a friend's that entire weekend, with it being 41 hours before they contacted police. Now on Saturday night, officers wasted no time going by all of Harley's friends' places and crossing them off the list. The searches continued as Christmas came and went, and with still no leads in January, both the FBI and the CBI were brought in. According to the local police chief, one of the CBI agents immediately requested to see Harley's neighborhood. He took her over there, and again right away, she inquired about this green two-story house across the street. The chief explained that it was an empty summer home with no signs of forced entry, and that their scent dogs didn't pick anything up outside. With that, still, this agent was adamant that they restart at square one and take a second look for Harley. That's exactly what they did, and while they found that the windows on this house were secure, there was also a lockbox on the front door and clearly ongoing renovations. The police chief actually called the owners, and after explaining the situation, the elderly couple was of course happy to let them take a look around. Upon going upstairs, officers would find a red puffer coat, a jersey, and a pair of boys glasses on one of the bedroom floors. All of this was directly under a vent hole, which would have opened up to the house's chimney. And while in a lot of cases we would see these chimneys go down to the first floor and open up to a fireplace, that wasn't the case here. There used to be a wood-burning stove there on the second floor, so the vent hole was used for heat ventilation through the chimney. Whoever removed that stove, and whenever they did, they bricked off the chimney completely, so it did not go down to the first floor. Now, initially with these findings, police didn't know what to think, because Harley being in there wasn't really plausible, and there weren't any smells of decomposition. They ended up putting a camera in the vent hole just to take a look, 
and when they still couldn't see anything, one of the officers made the decision to reach his hand inside. Horribly, he felt what he has described as a head of human hair. With that, and brick by brick, police dismantled the chimney and found Harley in the 9 by 13 inch opening. He was positioned with his head tilted towards the roof and had tragically died of positional asphyxiation. It was like any smell of decomposition had been locked in that chimney, and the coroner almost immediately ruled that it looked like an accident. As we know, today police believe that Harley, quote, climbed up the house's antenna tower that morning, and one way or another slid down into the chimney and got stuck. They actually think he was trying to hide and not go to school. That he first got stuck right above the vent hole, and he was taking his clothes off in an attempt to make himself smaller. They think this worked, and he slid down further, just to get stuck again where the chimney was bricked off. Now, of course, on the other side of this case, there's the belief that what happened to Harley was not an accident. You see, back before Harley disappeared, he had this YouTube channel where he would reveal his address and sometimes do live streams without a shirt. This attracting a predator could be one angle, but also, just listen to this clip from one of his videos we argued for about a good five minutes um yeah then she snapped and she locked me out of the house so right now i'm outside yep the house is locked it is 3 30 i haven't ate anything if you knew what was going on in my life it's just been a horrible week so from that, it's clear things weren't great at home. What we know is that Harley was actually diagnosed with Asperger's as a child, and then he got PTSD from being repeatedly beaten by his older sister. He was incredibly dependent and needed things in a very specific way, which could have been difficult a lot of the time. His mother even posted about how she didn't want kids, leading many to speculate. It's kind of like, why would you not check on her worry for your 14-year-old who had a fear of grass and needed to shower four times a day? They actually took away his cell phone, so it's not like he could have called for help. Today, there are still so many unanswered questions in Harley's case and I think one of the biggest reasons why is because him going up that ladder to go back down the chimney just doesn't make sense. But then again, I also wouldn't think it would make sense for someone to haul a kid up a TV antenna in broad daylight and then throw him down said chimney. On this one, let me know what you guys think. The thought of being just stuck like that, it literally, I just can't, I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't, oh my god. Oh my god but if you want more information on that case 10 to life here on youtube she did a whole video on it i think it's like an hour and 30 minutes long if you want to check that out i haven't watched it yet i don't know I, stuff like that triggers me so so bad so i'm telling y'all about it so y'all can watch it first and then tell me what happened Cause I don't know, I don't know if I could sit through a whole hour and 30 minutes about that little boy being stuck in that chimney. Like, oh no, that freaks me out so bad. <laughs> like I would be so anxious watching that, but whew, I wanted to bring it up for you guys. I'll link 10 to Live's video in the description of this video. If I forget, just remind me or just search it on YouTube. It'll pop up for you. Whew, but that literally gives me the chills. I cannot, I cannot, I cannot, I cannot, I cannot. Uh, but happened right in, it is March 22nd, 1999, and we are in Brooklyn, New York. On the evening of the 22nd, Dr. Jean-Claude Dominique, originally from Haiti, explaining the name, is finishing up his shift at the hospital. He's an ER doctor. And Dr. Dominique is leaving the hospital a little bit before midnight when he is struck by a vehicle. Dr. Dominique was a pedestrian. He was walking when this vehicle hit him at a super high speed and sent him flying, okay? And onlookers at the scene, the witnesses said that this seemed to be a deliberate like hit and run, okay? They hit Dr. Dominique all gas, no brakes and did not stop they sent him flying into the air and kept it pushing now dr dominique is still alive at the scene and is taken to the hospital with life-threatening injuries obviously and at just 49 years old and a very successful er doctor chow was brought into the same hospital he worked at with life-threatening injuries and so of course family soon gathered at the hospital his wife of 20 plus years, Elliot, probably pronounced a whole lot better, like with that Haitian dialect. I, I, I do what I can. <laughs> but Miss Elliot was a nurse at the hospital 20 years prior when they met. They hit it off, bonded over the fact that they were both Haitian. So soon she went from being a full-time nurse to a stay-at-home mother 
They bought a house in New Jersey, in the suburbs. And there was an apartment they shared before they got married that was originally Elliot's apartment. But it was only five minutes away from the hospital, so they kept this apartment for times when Dr. Dominique was on call or he had a super late night and he didn't want to make the commute back to the suburbs. Would you trust your man with his own apartment in the city? I guess if he never gave you a reason not to. Mm. But anyway, as Elliot would spend all of her nights at home in the suburbs, raising both the kids, plenty of nights, Dr. Dominique would be at the apartment in Brooklyn or at least that's where he was supposed to be. And they're living the perfect life, you know? She's a capped woman, she's at home taking the kids. They have two kids, a son and a daughter. Everything is everything, until it's not. Anyway, back to the hospital, the night of the accident. But Dr. Dominique is in the hospital, unconscious, in pretty bad shape. And when Miss Elliot gets to the hospital room, Dominique, Dr. Dominique is in the hospital bed, but his wife is already there, okay? Christina, Christina is already sitting at the bedside. Yeah, so there's a woman already there claiming to be John claude Dominique's wife. So there's a big like, who the fuck are you type of moment, you know? Doctors and staff are confused. And hell, so are the women. Let me give you some info on wife. Ooh, that's four fingers, wife number two. <laughs> now the second woman's name is Betsy Dominique, okay? And Miss Betsy also has two of Dr. Dominique's children, okay? And she says that they have been married for about 17 years, but they were both from the same city in Haiti. They grew up together and they had a relationship that kind of fizzled out when Dr. Dominique came to the United States, but they picked it up when Betsy came to the United States. So Miss Betsy says that she and Dominique were married 17 years ago after he divorced Miss Elliot. So both of them are at the hospital at this man's bedside deathbed and both of them claim, you know, that they have been married to him for over a decade. The hospital don't know what is going on. Everybody's confused, but Miss Betsy is able to produce her marriage license. So she is considered next of kin and Miss Elliot is asked to leave the hospital. And the one man who could possibly sort this out is comatose. And he stays that way for about a month, just in the hospital bed, not coming to. So the women kind of take turns visiting him neither of the women leave him just high and dry even though i would in the meantime miss elliot is just lost and unsure of what to do who to blame who to turn to um it seems as though dr dominique his family was aware of him having a second family across town a separate wife kids a separate house all of the things but they were loyal to him. They did not want to tell Miss Elliot anything. They didn't want to give her any information. They remained loyal to Dr. Dominique and kept his little secrets. And this is just the backstory, okay? This is not the crime. Him being hit by the car is not the crime we're here to talk about today, okay? But I have to say, I was not surprised in finding out that Dr. Dominique had two separate families on different sides of the East Coast, when I found out that he was one of 24 children. He had 23 brothers and sisters. So he obviously came from a long line of shucking and jiving. Now, these 23 brothers and sisters did not make it easy for Miss Elliot after his passing, like I said. He eventually does succumb to his injuries in the hospital and they want Miss Elliot to cash out for the funeral enough limousines to show for around all of his siblings and you know like a big huge funeral but miss elliot is not willing to do that because she technically at this time is not his wife she don't know how but this other lady got this marriage license and she and dr dominique's marriage 
is null and void, okay? So she's not trying to spend no parts of the $30,000 they were trying to put together for his funeral because she didn't even know where her next paycheck was going to come from, right? So after that, they iced her out of the funeral plans and everything like that. And she and her kids don't even get to give her husband, the ex-husband, used to be husband, part-time husband, a proper burial. But Miss Betsy and her kids are at the funeral. Honey, honey. But like I said, this is just the tip of the iceberg and a little bit of backstory. But I say all this to say, if Dr. Dominique could juggle being a father to four children in two separate households and a husband to two wives in two separate households and an emergency room doctor and that man won't text you back, let it go. Let it go. Summer is around the corner. Defrost your hot girl knees and get your lick back. For 17 years. 17 years? That's crazy. But like I said earlier, Dr. Dominique dies in the hospital April 30th, 1999. His death is investigated for a little while, but it really doesn't go anywhere. Um, the, the car that hit him was a Cadillac. It was found parked a block away. It had been reported stolen a few days prior. So this was a dead end. They do lift fingerprints from the car, but they aren't linked to anybody. And that's just that on that. They never to this day figure out what happened to Dr. Dominique? That's still an open case, but we're about to get into another one. So of course, after his passing, because of the legality of it all, him having two wives, but his first wife said they never got divorced, but his second wife said they did get divorced. He is a doctor. He's got multiple properties. The assets got to be divided, and this is where shit gets messy. And when it comes down to the legality of it all and him being married again, Miss Elliot is very confused as to how that even happened because they never got a divorce. And she doesn't really get light shed on the situation until she goes back to the apartment that was her apartment in Brooklyn to clean it out after the funeral, after he passed, after all the, the dust settles, you know, because that's kind of the only one asset she had that was in her name. Like Betsy could not touch this apartment because it was Elliot's, okay? So she's going through the apartment, cleaning things out, and she finds a manila folder with her name on it, her name on the front, and a bunch of paperwork inside the folder. And inside the folder is all of their divorce documents. But everything had been forged, her signature, all the hearings, like this was not her. She had no dealings, no participation in all of these divorce proceedings. But she finds out, you know, that Miss Betsy was not lying, that this man did have a whole ass divorce behind her back. Can you imagine finding out your husband got a divorce behind your back? Forged your signatures, body doubles, somebody standing in pretending to be you in hearings. I mean, you have to go to great lengths to have this type of secret divorce from the person you're divorcing. You know what I'm saying? Somebody would have had to die. I would have lost my marbles, but in this case, he beat her to it. So, but I mean, I say that to say, I'm sure this probably sent her spiraling because because Dr. Dominique was on his deathbed, couldn't ask him no questions. You know, it was easy to, to assume that Miss Betsy was lying or fabricating or scheming, scamming something. But obviously after finding all the divorce decrees and stuff like that in the condo, the apartment that Dr. Dominique spent most of his time in or was supposed to be spending most of his time in, you know, there was no refuting that, yeah, this is like, a scheme he set up for the BS. And not only did she find all the divorce decrees and find out, you know, everything Miss Betsy was saying was true. Jesus. But she figures out on paper, you know, she it says that she's the one who was filing for a divorce. But even though finding this paperwork is devastating, it is the proof that Miss Elliot needs to reverse all of the shenanigans and reclaim her assets, okay? First, she hires a lawyer. This lawyer hires a handwriting analysis, a handwriting specialist to prove that, you know, none of these divorce decrees, none of these signatures, she wasn't present for any of this. And so because she was not present for any of this, 
the divorce is ruled, you know, null and void. All right, they are still legally married. After this, it takes a little bit over a year for her to reclaim the asset. So a judge has to go back and say, you know, because this marriage never dissolved, it never ended in divorce because it's proven that the divorce was obtained illegally, yada, yada, yada. That made his marriage to Betsy null and void. So, so she was no longer entitled to his assets. And so everything goes back to Miss Elliot, okay? And that happens in July of 2000. Luckily for Betsy, Miss Elliot is not cruel and unusual. Can't say the same for myself, but she let Betsy keep the house that they shared in New Jersey. I think earlier I said that Elliot lived in New Jersey, but she lived in Long Island. And the second family lived in New Jersey. So she let Miss Betsy keep her house for her children. She did not snatch the house from up under her, which is very nice considering. And Miss Betsy's kids weren't left high and dry either. Like he had set up his own like separate things outside of the marriages for the children, life insurance policies, like all of that. Everything that was meant for the kids stayed meant for the, ch the kids, the children, okay? She didn't mess with none of that. But also another point of contingency, I guess you could say, was that first of all, Dominique seemingly, from what I could tell, had Betsy going 50-50. Like the house was half hers, half his paying the bills and then she was working as a landlord for some properties that he owned and she was you know being a landlord and collecting the rent for those properties as well as a beauty supply store but she wasn't as generous with this property she ordered miss betsy to immediately immediately stop collecting the rent this ain't yours and after that, you know, Miss Elliot, she goes back to her normal life. She picks back up with nursing. You know, she doesn't just collect these assets and sit on the money. She goes back to work. Mm -hmm. And this is where we're about to get into the true crime. The true crime, true crime of the true crime, the true crime inception. Okay. So this brings us to October 30th of 2000. A little bit over four months after, you know, she regained all of her assets. They're finally getting... You know, they're finally settling back into a sense of normalcy. And like I said, she's back working at the hospital. She works the early morning shift, so she's getting ready to head into the hospital. And y'all know it's cold up north in October. She goes out to start her car to warm it up and then goes back inside. So when she goes back outside to get in her car and leave for work, this is when shots break out. Miss Elliot is shot several times, but is able to retreat back inside of her home where her kids are. And they luckily at this point are old enough to call 911 for her. And ambulances, paramedics, everything, police arrive on the scene at about 5 a.m. that morning. Y'all be thinking I'm pregnant. I really don't mind when y'all ask me if I'm pregnant because it's because I always have my robe tied right under my boobs. So like it makes my stomach poke out and it do be looking pregnant. But I do that so I'm not sitting here with my titties out. But it's like, I don't know, do I want my titties out and look trashy? Or do I want the robe tied up to my titties and I look pregnant? I don't know. I don't know. Which one? <laughs> But of course, Miss Elliot is rushed to the hospital with her children by her side. She is shot twice in the head and once in the hand, okay? But she's coherent enough at the scene to tell detectives like what she remembered, what was going on, and she was ambushed by two men you know, as she was on her way to work, um, somebody who obviously knew her routine. This was obviously not random. It was a targeted attack. Somebody was trying to excommunicate her from the face of the earth. Just a few months after this crazy legal battle that she had went to, it was obviously not no coinky dink. And for whatever reason, these attempted hitmen left the gun at the scene. So they have a great place to start with their attempted murder weapon. She did not recognize the men at all. The two bullets to her skull grazed her and obviously the injury to her hand was non-fatal and they think Miss Elliot kind of saved her own life because she was very vigilant. She says that when she woke up, you know, and went out to go preheat her car, she noticed that her motion detector lights were already on. 
like before she had even walked out, you know, somebody had activated the motion detector lights. And she says, by the time she went out to get in the car, you know, she was already like scoping the scenery. So she was aware of her surroundings and as soon as she saw them running up on her, she turned to run back into the house and they think her whipping her head around to turn back into her house is what had these bullets graze her instead of like, you know, making direct contact and ending fatally for her. And when detectives, you know, ask her like, well, you know, what's going on? Who would have want to do this to you? And you know, she tells them everything that's going on. So detectives learn what had happened realize that and realize you know that there's someone with a motive to kill her you know miss betsy but before they can even get to questioning her later on that day cops posted outside of miss elliott's house see a man walking past on foot and in this area this man just kind of stuck out like a sore thumb so they stopped him and questioned him because they kind of felt like he was walking past the crime scene to see what he could see, to see what was going on outside of Miss Elliot's house, okay? This man's name is Alexander. And child, he was stressed out, cracked under the pressure of the interrogation fairly quickly and told detectives what he knew. And he said that about two months prior, he had been hit up by a friend or an acquaintance who was looking for a getaway driver for a murder for hire situation. And he said that the man who asked him to help him with the hit, his name was Marvin. So Marvin and Alexander were outsourced by a man named Joe. Okay. And they were all supposed to be getting $3,000 for taking part in this murder for hire. So they went to go talk to Joe. And Joe pretty much has the same story as Alexander. But what Alexander didn't know was who Joe was doing all this for and joe says that he was asked to be a part of this murder for hire plot not by betsy but by a man named ali dominique who was dr dominique's brother so joe says so joe is willing to tell the truth because he says he backed out at the last minute he didn't want no parts of leaving a mother of two dead on her front door okay so alexander was there in the car. Allie was there driving and then Marvin was their gunman. Joe goes on to tell detectives that the motive for the murder was the fact that Elliot had taken the rental properties, the beauty supply store, all that that I was telling y'all about that Betsy was collecting rent on. He wasn't happy about that because he and Betsy were in on that business venture together. So when Elliot took it away from Betsy, she took it away from Allie as well. And because everybody is willing to cooperate, this comes together not even a full two days after Miss Elliot's shooting, okay? They scoop Allie, Dominique up, and he confesses to the murder for hire. Everybody just confessing, but he says he did it in self-defense because he felt like Elliot was going to come after him because he felt like Elliot was the one who killed his brother. Dr. Dominique, he felt like the car accident was set up by Elliot for the BS. Okay, but detectives don't really believe this, especially because Allie's story is the only one that differs from the other three men involved. And Joe, the one who backed out at the last minute, said that this was just one stop in like a murder for hire tour to be the only next of kin left to Dr. Dominic's estate. So he said, so Joseph said, so Joe said that Allie wanted to kill Elliot first and then Betsy and then Betsy's two children and then... Elliot's two children so he would be the only one left to collect his brother's money. He wanted to kill Elliot first so it looked like Betsy killed Elliot and then he was gonna kill Betsy to make it look like her kids, Elliot's kids. Mm. Okay it's a little bit later that made my nerves bad. I had to call my man to watch the cameras because all I saw was somebody walking away from my house sticking something into their waistband and my nerves was bad. But y'all, he was apparently trying to sell something. Either way, knocking on my door like you the police before 3 a.m., before 3 p.m. It's crazy. Basically, the whole thing was a scheme. Allie set up 
for the BS. I'm gonna put all of our perpetrators, all four of them on the screen with labels and their sentencing since it is so many moving parts. But um, the sentencing definitely was light, but obviously this was an attempted at murder plot. They didn't succeed, so the sentence is lighter, which is crazy. They all would've got life fooling around with me. I couldn't be on the jury. I couldn't be a judge because this warranted a life sentence. Planning to kill somebody's whole legacy so you can get the money. Everybody should've got life. I also think it's fair to speculate that Ali is probably the one who murdered Dr. Dominique. If he wanted this man's money so bad and he was willing to kill everybody else, he's probably the one who planned the first murder, right? But anyways, that is a wrap on today's case. My nerves are bad. I'm about to go lay down. Bye. <laughs> Your parents say that they don't let their kids do sleepovers. This is why. This is a 57-year-old man, and he just turned himself in for something that he did last year at his 12-year-old daughter's sleepover with her friends. So basically, his 12-year-old daughter had a sleepover. We know what some other girls came over. And he was pretty active with them throughout the night. They were in the basement doing facials. He just kept popping in, you know, which makes me wonder, where was the mother? But anyway, and towards the end of the night, 9 to 10 o'clock, he offered them smoothies. But the smoothies had benzos in it. And one girl said that she didn't like smoothies. But he made her another one and insisted that she drink it. So she drank it. The girls reported that they felt groggy and started to feel dizzy and sleepy and one girl even said she pretended to be asleep and she could feel him standing over her watching her. Another girl he waved his finger and under her nose to see if she was breathing and waved his hand across her face. Another girl said that she just didn't go to sleep because she didn't know what was going on. She felt something wasn't right. She fought asleep. So 2 a.m. rolls around. One girl decides to get in touch with her mother. She texts her, Mom, come get me. I do not feel safe. Come get me. Say it was a family emergency. Please, please, please wake up. Come get me. Her mother is asleep. She doesn't respond. So the girl gets in touch with another family member that is an adult. And she comes and gets the girl and takes the girl home to her mother her parents and they wake up they call the other girl's parents and the other girl's parents goes to his house to get their kids but get this he didn't want to open the door saying that they were asleep come back in the morning what if you don't open this door and give me my kids he finally opens the door and the parents take the girls to the hospital and they find traces of benzo in their system so whatever he had planned, it didn't happen. But you can just about guess what he had planned for these girls. Which makes me wonder what the hell he been doing with his own child. Some of her other friends at other occasions. But he has turned himself in and um, he will be going to prison soon. 57. They're 12. What was the plan? I had to put my do-rag on and come talk to y'all about this one because is that not insane? A 57-year-old man in a house full of 12-year-old girls. Probably something he had been plotting and planning for months. It makes you wonder if the sleepover in general, what was his whole idea? And like this lady says, where was the mama? She probably in on, uh, mm -mm. Because, no. Where was the mother when he was doing all this, making the smoothies? Waving his finger under people's nose. Jail. Immediate jail. This is like the worst of the worst thing that can happen. What would you do if you went to go pick up your daughter from a sleepover? Because she texted you and told you she didn't feel safe. And then when you get there, the man refuses to open the door. I know I already said it once in this video, but somebody would have had to die.